Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, another live broadcast from the Center of Victory Farm, a monastic inspired uh, what is it? Center for the Humanities. Um, today, we're here to talk about the question concerning technology. Um, I was going to take a second to highlight a couple of things before we jump in. Um, yeah, well, I guess the only thing I really wanted to say um, is that this is the first event that we've done that's technically going up on a YouTube that is not that was not advertised on Facebook or in the newsletter or anywhere else. And the reason for that is that this is sort of piggybacking on our reading of being in time. And so um, uh, this is a sort of advanced seminar. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're kind of approaching it at this level of being already somewhat familiar with, if not Heidegger, at least continental philosophy. So, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> You're not, Brian feels like an imposter, but he read being in time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, how, how, how was it, y'all? Just reading? Was great, and I really liked the uh, the braver book just to give me a little a little help. And uh, so I read each of them twice. I so they were short thinking, enough. I wish I had had time or forethought to read them twice. Or at least the high. I didn't know the <sighs> oh, braver man. existed because I'm terrible at Facebook and I didn't see that. And I was like, I want to read this twice, but I did not do it on this. But I like it. I had a question that I wrote down that I thought would be cool if people could all take a turn answering. But I mean, obviously, you're not required to. Um, and that's basically just like why this text. Um, why did you read it? You know, um, if it's just because we were doing it, that's an okay answer. But um, in my own case, it's because this has been a really influential. Um, sort of stepping stone in my in my studies, and um, I think Michael might say something similar. But Brian had not read it yet, and we've I've been referencing this for the last year because he, when I first moved in with Brian, one of the things he did was he read an essay, he proofread an essay for me, where I touched on questions concerning technology for I don't know, like a page. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Did it? It wasn't like, oh, now I get all that stuff. I was like, oh, here are all these words Dave uses all the time. <laughs> cool. Uh, and I'd say that's more or less why I wanted to read it. Dave talks about it a lot. It tends to be why I read any philosophy I read at this point in my life. It's because Dave talks about it a lot. Um, and simply because. Um, Kind of as I was getting at, I'm not only shitty at Facebook, I just have a general distaste for um, technology that's really unexamined. And uh, I thought that based on what I've heard, that this is a really good place to start to actually think about technology, whatever that is. Um, right. And and actually start to like be able to formulate some thoughts behind, behind just the general grossness, I feel, with everything, about everything. How about you guys? Uh, I was interested in reading this because I'm interested in technology um, and the philosophical implications of technology and uh, the potential usages of technology as a means of escape, um, escape from a particular assemblage or milieu. Um, yeah, and you guys were reading it, so I'm not super interested in Heidegger. Um, I think it's important that I have at least an understanding of him, but I don't 
typically find him the most interesting thinker. Um, I don't really know why, but um, I think it's important to understand what he's talking about. So, yeah. Yeah, I originally went into Heidegger because he was just kind of like, I saw him as a, a focal point where existentialism, phenomenology, hermeneutics all kind of converged to break the modern project and then explode into, you know, actual existentialism, or at least, you know, self-labeled existentialism, post-structuralism, later phenomenology, etc. And uh, only deconstruction, obviously. And so I wanted to understand this key thinker because he's very influential Everyone in France was trying to be the Heidegger, right, for a little while there. And uh, I, I, I was always kind of, um, I don't know, I, I, I guess my, my honors thesis for my undergrad uh, senior year um, was this 45-page paper on technology. And the lit review for that, um, I mean, it was pretty much everything I could find for philosophy of technology. Um, I didn't read Virilio, sadly. I would, I wish I would have. Um, you need to read the Virilio. <laughs> I know. Welcome, Tegan. So yeah, yeah. That that was a so. When I was reading all these different thinkers, and, and there were like anthologies of essays and stuff like that, um, I just did not find most philosophy of technology that illuminating. None of them really gave me a sort of like, whoa, I don't know. I, I look for those moments of like where, where things start to make sense, and then you you just don't ever see a light switch the same way after kind of digesting this essay. So um, that's why I harp back to it. What I liked about this was um, one of the main things that hit me is the, the distinction between technology per se and the essence of technology. You know, technology per se is kind of like how to do things. What's it look like? You know, it, kind of descriptive and like, oh, that's all there is. And uh, for Heidegger, the essence of technology is, what is it? And when I read that, it was like, bang, it's kind of like slapped me in the face. It's like, what is it? That's a question that a machine wouldn't ask. A machine would ask <laughs> yeah. What it is, a person would, whatever a person is. And uh, when he says like, you know, the direction at the beginning, this tech of this uh, this piece, uh, you know, the direction is what's really important. Not not the sentence structure shot and such. I don't know if that was like a dig at certain people, <laughs> but uh, I just found that um, that that difference real real interesting. Like, um, what is this thing that asks what something is, rather than how it works, and just assumes that itself is just another object, you know, like the machines. I'd like to think I'm more than just another object. Of course, I'm full of myself, so. But. Michael, if you don't talk, I'll just read what you said on Instagram. <laughs> No, I'll, I'll talk. Uh, so I guess my, my history with text goes back a long time. I probably read it, let's see, for the first time nine, eight years ago, something like that. It was right after I got done studying Bean and Time and going through Hubert Dreyfus's lectures. <clears throat> and, the, yeah, the second thing I read after Bean and Time was basic writings. And it just – I didn't think anything could blow my mind more than – being in time and then I read basic writings and sure enough uh, these essays are just some of my absolute favorite out of all the philosophy I've read over the years and I mean I'm, if I'm being honest I am some kind of Heideggerian um, 
uh, Heidegger's philosophy has connected with me more than even all the other guys I love, like Marx and Baudrillard, Deleuze, Lacan. Um, and so I think what Heidegger had to contribute uh, on the subject of being is of fundamental utmost importance for our situation. And this essay in particular gets at it probably better than anywhere else in his, uh, his whole body of work. And I mean, it's just amazing the implications it has. I mean, obviously there's issues with reading his language, of course, and getting accustomed to him. And you do need to read a bunch of his other essays to connect all the types, you know, the little phrases he uses and all this, but what I, what I still admire about Heidegger and what I hope uh, is an influence he has on me, if you notice when reading the text, there, there's no wasted time. He doesn't go off on other subjects like so many philosophers that we love do. And I mean, you can say, well, that's great. They're making these connections to some marginal aspects of things or whatever. But Heidegger, you read him, it's like reading Spinoza's Ethics or Descartes' Meditations. It is incredibly concise and thought out and everything is important. Everything it means something. And in a lot of the, you know, postmodern and even post postmodern, that era of French thought, those texts read a lot differently. And I always enjoy going back to Heidegger because he just, you know, despite the difficulty of some of his terminology, he just doesn't waste time. He says what he's trying to say. And even if the terms are odd for us in the English speaking world, he, he, he is really doing his best to communicate what he has to say concisely. And I think a uh, question concerning technology is a great, great example of that. And as far as the importance of it, I mean, you know, he, he develops this in uh, Introduction to Metaphysics, but what you have in inframing is the fundamental connection between the Western capitalist, you know, versus the, the Eastern actually existing socialisms, you find that they both have inframing at their core. And that despite the supposed ideological differences, they're both the same society insofar as they both are operating according to the same unconcealment of beings, the same mode of truth, Aletheia. Um, and so I think that's a very, very interesting insight that he had is that despite the surface ideological differences, both actually existing socialisms and capitalisms are operating on the same model of being. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's seen that, that short little video that drives Marxists crazy where Heidegger quotes, uh, what that, uh, Orbeck, um, the famous quote, right? Philosophers only. It's yeah. And it's also the whole thing about how Marx or Marxists didn't really think out what a world is. They want to change the world, but they didn't really think what worldhood as such is. And I think that's a fair criticism as somebody who is deeply inspired by Marx and loves his work. I think Heidegger's right. I mean, to really, if we say we're trying to actively change the world, we need to know what a world is. And just simply talking about models of the means of production isn't really going to get it. Yeah. And, uh, I couldn't help but think about Nancy Fraser on this reading because there's, uh, like a three hour talk where, where she and David Harvey are talking about Marxism today. And um, the whole time she's talking, you know, she's talking about externalities and the things that are presumed, the, the things that are necessary in order to even look at the economy, which obviously includes like women's la labor, um, on completely unpaid labor, like slavery, um, you know, and, and all, these, uh, all these other things, resources, natural resources and stuff like that. And and, I was just, and, and, and and you can't not think. Oh yeah, well that's the. I mean that's kind of what this extension does, kind of at least for me.
anybody have any ideas how the end framing changes? And this whole thing about the saving power of um, where the um, well, well, it's given that there's yeah. a, a different takes on what's concealment and unconcealment, and uh, that there's a saving power in there that's the highest dignity of the human essence. And, uh, right, you know, and I thought it might be useful, and I don't know if you'll be comfortable doing this. Uh, I wonder if you'd take a stab, Michael, at. Um, <sighs> I, and I know it's going to be, you know, it's how do you do this, right? But like the Heideggerian idea of truth, right? It, it seems pretty central to, to some of what he's getting at with. No, I mean, I, I can say something about that. Um, I, look, I, th I think we all know that when you start getting into Heidegger, the main term is being. And then the question becomes, all right, he uses this term so much, but what the hell does it mean? And a lot of the times it's not clear and you got to go to being in time. And then this, this concept changes and evolves over his later period. And, you know, even in recent Heidegger scholarship, there's this ongoing debate and it's, you know, it's kind of framed the, the debate between Thomas Sheehan and Richard Capo Bianco. Um, Thomas Sheehan will tell you that being essentially means meaning or significance. Whereas Richard Campobianco, and I think he, he proves this beyond a shadow of doubt with the, his citations to the later Heidegger, later Heidegger at points will say being is not reducible to meaning. It's not what I said earlier on. It's not, or at least it's not just that. Being is also phusis, the temporal spatio, uh, uh, spatio-temporal emergence of beings into space and time, right? It, it, it's very similar to what Deleuze is describing in difference and repetition. This physical process of nature actualizing various entities. And that is something that is not dependent on human beings. I mean, unless you want to go full on transcendental idealist or a full on idealist, whatever. Um, we want to, I think we all would agree that galaxies were here before we showed up, before there was Dasein. And so phusis in this sense is the actualization of entities in space and time. And so that would be something different than being as meaning or what Hubert Dreyfus and a lot of Heideggerians would prefer to call familiarity, our familiarity with things, right? What gives them their fundamental ontological sense is our background practices that orientate us into a certain epoch of being. And for Heidegger, he connects being to truth. And the reason why he sees this connection to being and truth is, well, for one, we know in Being in Time, he critiques Descartes and he, cre he critiques the whole philosophical tradition that says our fundamental relationship to the world is the relationship of a subject over against an object. That I only know the object through my mental representations in the interiority and in the confines of my mind and Heidegger obviously just, I, I think he lays waste to that and with his phenomenological descriptions. For the most part, there are no mental representations or uh, go-betweens between us and the world. We just skillfully cope with things. We turn on the lamp. We walk through the kitchen. You know, we just know how to cope with the world. And it doesn't take any conceptual mediations to do that. And long story short, there's a certain theory of truth that goes along with the old subject object schema, which is the correspondence theory of truth. Truth is when a statement corresponds to a state of affairs in the world, right? Or truth is a concept in the head that corresponds to a state of affairs. Uh, you find this in Wittgenstein's Tractatus. I mean, it's, you find it in Aquinas, the old adequatio theory of truth. So this is how philosophers have primary primarily define truth as the correspondence between some mental entity, be it a concept, an idea, a proposition, and a state of affairs. But what Heidegger points out is for there to be a correspondence between any mental entity and the exterior world, 
the exterior world itself has to be present. And so does the being that has the mental representation. And that means that there's a more primordial truth and the very being of things being there, you know, being present, existing. That is the condition of there even being a correspondence between certain entities. And so he's going to say that prim primordial truth is the very being, the very presencing of entities in space and time. And that's how he makes the connection there. And so what we're getting here in this essay is he's saying, look, the Greeks had an understanding of being, the Christians had an understanding of being, and even though he doesn't use some of the terminology that I think is helped from, from being in time, the idea is that, look, the Greeks had certain background practices that organized and orientated them in their world that made their immediate embrace of entities, the, the, the unconcealment of entities, reveal itself to them in a specific way. Well, the same is true of the medieval Christians, and even in one of his lecture series, The Sophist, um, he hints towards there was a Roman understanding of being. He doesn't do much with it, but he gives the Romans. And I think, honestly, if we were to branch this out, we could easily talk about a Buddhist understanding of being or a Hindu understanding of being. I don't really think it's something the West has uh, a monopoly on. Um, and the idea is that with different understandings of beings, uh, a different understanding of being, we have different truth events. Uh, things are true in different ways in different societies. And it's a fundamentally how we understand being that all of our different various presuppositions in a sense branch off from that, right? So there's things, statements that you could just say during the medieval period. Uh, well, this, you know, man is better than animals, right? Man is higher than animals. That's not something that they would have even needed justification for based on how they understood being at the time. Now, we will challenge that, right? But <clears throat> they certainly wouldn't because of their understanding of being. And so now we're, we have this understanding of being, but what's peculiar to it is it's highly reductionistic. Um, it's the understanding of being that's best exemplified in scientism. There's one way to see the world. That's it. All the other ones are irrelevant or irrational or mythological, right? And so it wants to lock us into this one understanding of being, which is really the understanding of being of industrial society, both Western capitalism and Eastern, quote, socialism, both fit this model where it's all about what, you know, hyper industrialization, uh, the world is there to meet our desires and our needs. And it doesn't leave room for, as he likes to talk about in poetic terms, the shining of being, the gleaming of being, where things are radiant in, in and of themselves. They have a certain worth or value in and of themselves, how they're present. They're not merely there to be transformed into energy sources for us to store up and use for our means. There's a certain presence uh, or value in the entities themselves that for us, we just are blind to based on in framing. Uh, at least most of us are. And so that's the great threat is when you treat nature as a gas station, as he said, I think it's in discourse and method. He makes that famous thing that nature is basically a gas station for us. Um, the great danger is that this leads to our eventual annihilation, right? If we just, I, I mean, I mean, I'm putting words in his mouth, but essentially his point is if we just keep consuming and keep inframing everything, we're going to exhaust the resources. There's no balance in this relationship. And if that's the case, then much of humankind is going to die as a result of this. And that's why there's this great threat. But Bert, to what you're saying about the saving power, I take it, and again, he's very elusive at the end about what he's getting at, but I take it that the more we meditate and reflect on being, even if it's in framing, which is a mode of revealing, it is a way things are present to us. And so it is locked into this legacy of being. The more we reflect on it, the greater chance we have of attuning ourselves to being and standing open to a new mode of being should, it, should the event happen that brings it forth. Right, coming into a free relationship with it, right? Yeah. 
Because the idea is that beings can reveal themselves in all sorts of ways. And even if in the West, there's been three primary ways on a mass level, right? Greek, Christian, capitalist, or industrialist. Um, the, I mean, Plato had a different understanding of being and Aristotle, and you can say Descartes and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and all these guys had various understandings. And again, you could certainly find it in Hinduism or Buddhism. They had different understandings of what it means to be. And so there's all kinds of modes of revealing that are possible for us uh, and, and that are possible to become the default. And it's not necessarily we even have to rely on former modes of being, like we're waiting for an old one to come back. It could be something that's never taken hold, as he would put it, in the clearing. But ultimately, um, the, I mean, we could think about a type of shepherd understanding of being that it, our duty isn't just to use beings for our own mean and purpose. There's a sense in which we are there to shepherd them, to protect them. That would drastically give rise to a totally different type of world. It would be a very e ecologically friendly or mindful world, right? And um, yeah, so that's what he's getting at. And the idea of the saving power is just the more we think being, the more we accustom ourselves to making this difference between being and beings and seeing the logic of being and how it's worked over times, there's a saving power in that possibly, that we get more attuned to being as such. Right, and part of the danger, um, especially as, as Lee Braver puts it, you know, because he, he makes sure to point out that Heidegger, as always, is not so interested in the ontic, and in this case that would be the ecological disasters or what have you, but is more interested in the ontological, what this means for us vis-a-vis -vis being. And um, the danger, uh, he was saying, was that not only are we, yeah, what, headed for an utter disaster, you know, if we stay on that course, but um, at the same time, Dasein or, or the human is challenged forth just as we challenge forth the uh, nature as standing reserve. And so um, just as we just as we think that we are the masters and possessors, just when we think that you're flipping that light switch and you're in control in all reality, it's more as how Marx talks about how the workers become like, you know, they, they become attenuated to the gears of the factory, right? We become what well, you don't really have a choice. There's like an illusion of, of freedom, but this is, you're thrown into this thing that you have to reproduce and you're on call for everyone else in service of their desires, just as, they are for yours, unequally, of course. So I was wondering if um, there's there's lots of ways of going about this. I'm, uh, like I was wondering if we could take suggestions. I have a bunch of notes on the whiteboard um, that I could like run over, um, or I don't know. Michael just said a lot, and maybe someone has questions to something specific. Well, you know, initially when um, Heidegger was talking about the saving power, and I thought, well, you know, this isn't too specific. Maybe you should get more political. Well, you know, he might have been a little gun shy about getting political. Uh, <laughs> and uh, given that capitalism, communism, and fascism were the the basic options that all seem a little problematic, I, I, it probably was best that he didn't stray into that. But, you know, we, um, I do wonder about the political implications of, you know, in framing. You know, we talk about a new symbolic project, and um, I just wonder if, like, some kind of um, ecological challenges will kind of uh, create a new in framing, like there'll be a different sense of thrownness that we, we respond to, but... Uh, Damn, I don't think I want to live through that shit. <laughs> no, I, think I, I think I would rather, like, you know, take Heidegger's path. It seems less fearsome. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've, I've thought about that a lot. And um, Heidegger is very much kind of, you know, they call it his quietism, where he's kind of resigned to the fact. And, I mean, I think he's right. There's a sense in which none of us are just going to, form some consensus and a new 
understanding of being is going to emerge from that. It doesn't work through human will. And it, it is this kind of this, this pure event that there, you can't really even talk about the cause of it. Right. It's that's what he's talking about in contributions to philosophy uh, where he's very focused on the, the notion of being as this event. And the idea is just that each understanding of being each epoch of being, it's as if it just comes out of nowhere. You can't really talk about any causal, uh, mechanism that brings it forth. And because of that, Heidegger's resigned to the fact that, look, there's nothing that we can just actively do to change our understanding of being. It's the most fundamental presupposition. I mean, if we want to talk in psychoanalytic terms, it's the unconscious of the unconscious, right? It's the, the bedrock of human intelligibility. And, but, but to me, and again, this is where I disagree with Heidegger, or at least kind of disagree. Look, we can't think of the event of the Christian understanding of being emerging without certain historical aspects. We, I mean, Jesus and then Paul's epistles and Constantine, and there's all of this, these historical events that in a sense were conditions of this Christian understanding of being emerging. Not one of them is the cause. You couldn't really say what it, what dynamics between them led to it because, you know, it, there's always the possibility it wouldn't have happened. But Christianity was this very marginal thing when it first started, and yet it becomes the clearing itself. Well, I would argue that the only way we can, in a sense, for lack of a better word, tinker with being is to develop new marginal background practices, to nurture the clearing, nurture the background, because you never know what's going to emerge out of that. And you know, there's a chance maybe we could get something worse than in framing. Who knows? I mean, you know, but we know that in framing's bad and we, we already have an idea of where it's headed. So I think the idea of cultivating different types of art or music, uh, experimenting with architecture, um, there's all kinds of ways I think that you can try to d develop the background that maybe something would emerge out of it, but it's ultimately a kind of random event that, you know, that's what Badu's big thing is and being an event. Now, now you said it's bad in framing and there is, this, I do get the, the impression that it's bad in the sense it reduces being to just in framing that it, it, it's the, the essence of Dasein is that we are the being that is capable of receiving all sorts of unconcealment from being there we can we can to cut the jargon out we can perceive things in a whole myriad of ways right there's all kinds of ways that things can show themselves to us and the bad element of in framing is it locks us into a reductionistic mode of revealing this is all that there is is there's stuff that can be transformed and stored up for our needs which is a very consumeristic type of unconcealment, industrialism, all, uh, industrialization, so on and so forth. And it just makes us basically treat nature as a gas station, as he puts it. And so that's what's bad about it is it, in a sense, gets in the way of our own essence, which is to see nature in its fullness as much as we possibly can, right? And this locks us into this very rigid mode of Unconcealment. In what way is in framing really that distinct from uh, alienation in Marx? Um, it's something I was thinking about throughout. It seems very similar to alienation in so far as to use like Deleuze Guattarian language, it seems to code all of being or all of nature uh, towards a particular code. So it decodes them of all exterior meaning and produces in them uh, interior meaning to the inframed meaning of this sort of accumulation. I can't remember the exact phrase. Uh, the um, standing reserve uh, doesn't seem all that different from 
the accumulation of capital. Um, and capital is not really that distinct from energy to me anyway. Um, so I, that was something that was kind of popping out to me that it seemed very similar to alienation. And I know alienation kind of went out of vogue in Marxist literature in the time Heidegger was most predominant, like Stalin and Lenin didn't really talk too much about alienation. It kind of came back in in the 1950s. Um, but I, I'm just wondering, there, I'm, there likely wasn't that much of an influence there. I'm not sure how much Marx Heidegger would have read, but um, that's something I was thinking through when reading this. No, I, I, I think you could certainly frame it in terms of alienation. I think what Heidegger would say, though, is if you list the, those, the four modes of alienation that Marx lays out, um, they're alienation essentially from ourselves. Uh, so I'm alienated from myself, I'm alienated from, or my species being, I'm alienated from the others in my society. But he doesn't, Marx didn't think being as the very mode of revealing or the very presencing of entities. And I mean, yeah, I've, I've written, I think you're absolutely right. There's a connection between inframing and capital. That's one of the things I've written on. Um, and you can see even some of that language, if, if, if you pay attention to somehow how he words things in here, he definitely seems to be, he talks about accumulation at one point or something. Um, and um, yeah, I definitely see that. But yeah, I think you would say the main difference is just Marx just didn't see the, the central role, the different, the ontological difference. There's being and beings, and the very mode of how things reveal themselves to us is very different from uh, concrete beings. And on top of it, I mean, yes, it, a mode of being. You know, he talks about uh, language is the house of being. So obviously, being's going to affect language. Or, and we could talk about coding in DNG's sense, but ultimately it's this kind of implicit principle that just shapes everything around us, our, our behavior, our presuppositions. And as long as that holds sway, we are in a sense destined by that. That's why he likes that word destining uh, is there's really no, no way for us just to turn it off and kick into another mode of being. Um, I, not to rail against Christian fundamentalism, but I'm, you know, I grew up surrounded by Christian fundamentalists. And despite how much they pray or they study the Bible, you find that in their behavior, they're still just doing consumer activities every day. And they don't really have any fundamental difference. Whereas I do think if we could somehow you know, hop in the DeLorean and go talk to a medieval monk, you're going to sense a difference in this person opposed to modern day Christians, because this guy really does have, he's operating on a different mode of being. And um, for Heidegger, it, it channels everything. And so, the, I, I mean, I think the political import of this is that, yes, we can have different policies or we could, you know, we could talk about who owns the means of production. Are they private or socialized? All of these various types of political issues. But for Heidegger, if we want to talk about a fundamental shift in society. It's going to involve a new mode of being. I would also want to throw in the and, and and okay, you. I think you indicated there's four kinds of alienation. I know of one, right? I know of the worker being alienated from their surplus labor, um, the additional time and energy that a person would typically have in their week to do personal or community sort of oriented, nonprofit driven things things that aren't necessary for survival, but those, that time and energy gets generated, siphoned away into ultimately the pockets of some shareholders of a company and you're not getting ownership, uh, you know, with, you know, for that and therefore it's exploitation. This is alienation because you're making stuff for someone else, not for yourself. And, um, that's kind of, that's kind of how I understand it. And I just wanted to say that like, so, so, but, but in that, the kind of way I was thinking about it, Oh, look out for the cat, Josh. Josh, get in here. Get in here. Sorry, I'm welcome. Here. welcome. But for those for those who can't see, Eddie, Frank, and Josh have all joined us um, since the beginning of this. So There's you, you can see people's see. hands. Maybe yeah. Um, but I just want to say, in framing, 
I'm, the way I'm seeing it is in framing is like a basis, the ontological basis, alienation as one of the things that happens within its sway. That's how you would call it. And scientism, on the other hand, right? Because I don't, I don't think that from alienation we get scientism very easily, right? So the nice thing about inframing is that it makes sense of both scientism and alienation. And that, that scientism really is the chance, it's the reducing of everything down to physics and uh, the privileging of manipula manipulation and efficiency over any other kind of knowledge. And um, I just thought a, a really good example of this, and most people, maybe none of you, studied in the analytic philosophy department, except Josh was about to sit down, <laughs> who's still, still, you know, he's going through the same program I went through. Um, the analytic approach would be to look at these four causes, if you're going to look at these four causes in, in respect of technology, and then to figure out which one is the most fundamental, and then kind of get rid of the other ones, right? Um, and you'll notice that Heidegger is doing something very different, that that it's these four that he's saying that in in this in this sort of scientistic um, era of inframing that everything is collapsed down to efficiency everything's down to that causal efficiency causa efficiency God I, I I'm gonna butcher that efficient cause efficient cause He's English it, just call it the efficient cause Well I didn't, I didn't even say that I'm not I'm a Aquinas scholar so I get nervous but <laughs> um. The final formal material causes of basically been um, considered superfluous or uh, unnecessary, um, both by philosophy, by modern and contemporary philosophy, and by uh, especially by contemporary analytic philosophy. And so I don't know if anybody wants to, to help unpack that a little bit, but I think it would be worth talking about how the four, how Heidegger's approach to those four phenomena works instead of, you know, this kind of either or approach. So, Michael, we can't see, we, we see that you say something, but we can't see it. With oh, okay. That's just the four modes of alienation Marx lays out in the uh, 1844 manuscripts. Uh, the, the alienation of the worker from their product. So at the end of the production process, you yourself don't own what you created, the capitalist does, so you're alienated from that. Two, alienation of the worker from the act of production. The wage labor, We everybody knows how mind-numbing that is. You're not fully present in your labor because it's not, you're, you're doing something you don't really want to do that you're not invested in, and so there's a split between you and your act of production. Alienation of the worker uh, from species essence. Um, again, it's it's this idea that the way I read it is we want to produce things in a kind of meaningful way, a type of artisan would, right? We don't get to do that. Um, and so the very act of creativity in us to produce and create, we're alienated from that. And then alienation of the worker from other workers, the division of labor, uh, capitalist relations. We, we don't interact with the other workers who are producing the other parts of the products we make, or it, it's the fragmentariness of the, our mode of production. And so Heidegger, if you go through this, he would say these are all ontic modes of alienation. Whereas if we, if we want to use that term in an ontological context, what we're alienated from in relationship to being is the fullness of being. And so what he calls the forgetfulness of being, we could easily call alienation from being, right? Because we're stuck in this reductionistic mode, whereas being or, or, or entities can show themselves in much fuller ways than just standing reserve. And so we're alienated from that. And in being alienated from being, if Heidegger's right and our essence is to be the being that has this uh, embrace or this beholding of being, then we're alienated from ourselves because being has it, in framing has reduced us to in framing. We're locked into this reductionistic mode. 
Well, you know, there's um, just in framing the um, the instrumentality of it, the scientism of it. You know, that just everything is a cog in a larger machine. Everything is an object. Uh, everything has a price tag. Everything has an exchange value. You know, this all kind of fits together. And the idea of like how to overcome that, you know, I, I am unfortunately apocalyptic. I, I think that, you know, there's going to have to be a massive social ecological dislocation that makes getting from today to tomorrow on the basis of exchange value uh, impossible. And I don't know what would take its place. Use value that we uh, we're just glad to have enough food to exist. If uh, supply lines are destroyed, if uh, there's massive migrations, um, rising sea level, depending on how quickly it happens. And it, it could be that this might be a toxic brew. You know, Heidegger talks about kind of like using the bad parts of the inframing as kind of a leverage. Sloterdijk mentions that too in, in habits forming different habits, but I just wonder if, uh, you know, the, like a new in framing will kind of occur, it'll be a confluence of, of events and that, uh, you know, what Heidegger's sort of interested in is a more poetic understanding, a more poetic in framing. And, you know, there's aspects of, uh, of uh, scientific uh, thought and practice that have poetic sides. And, uh, but, you know, this is like extrapolating probably hundreds of years in the future after we've all had terrible deaths <laughs> or something. But I just, you know, the way dislodging the instrument, the instrumentalism and the scientism and the exchange of value, it just seems like, I don't know, like the apocalypticist in me thinks that, uh, a, re a revolution of uh, structure and everything is going to be forced upon us. And, uh, of course, that assumes the whole world unites in a similar manner, which is, you know, not necessarily something I can hope for. But just dislodging you know, that instrumentalist thing, you know? There's there's other th another issue, and I think Lee Braver is especially good on explaining this, is is that if we stand here and we go, okay, in framing is this fundamental problem. How do we make being work for us? Well, we're, we're still in framing. We're still locked in that. That's, a, that's exactly right. We're, we're approaching the problem in instrumentalist terms. And so, I, I mean, even if, if we try to solve the problem of in framing, we find that our approaches are forms of in framing, or, or at least are rooted in in framing. And so this is why, you know, Heidegger always wanted to reject the idea of being a pessimist. He, he same with being an optimist. He, the way he saw it is that we just don't know what being's going to do. And he, this is a point he really emphasizes in contributions to philosophy. Um, there's this kind of waiting we have to do where we kind of have to wait. And yeah, it helps for us to think being and to contemplate it and to discuss it. But ultimately, if a new understanding of being emerges and gives rise to you know what we call a new symbolic order it's not going to be anything we've actively done and so i mean there's something disheartening in that especially those of us who are some types of leftists that believe in some kind of concrete praxis uh we should be doing something you know uh the Leninist question what is to be done but I think the what he's gone through and, and the way he's analyzed being, there is a sense where if we look at it historically, like he does, it, it, there is no consensus. There is no, nobody, you know, there was no point in 16th or 17th century where people got together and said, okay, this old mode of revealing is outdated. Let's have this new industrialist capitalist mode of revealing. Let's go with that. Just doesn't happen that way. And so, it's frustrating, but I, I do. I think there's. I think we can expand this. I don't think we're just stuck in. Well, let's sit around and twiddle our thumbs. I, I think there. You know, the idea of cultivating the background, trying to develop new ways of thinking, new forms of art, 
new activities, I think the it's like planting a seed. And even if there is no direct causal relationship between cultivating the background and a new understanding of being, we can't deny that there is a kind of ontic foundation for being. And this is something that I, I diverge with Heidegger on, but we just can't think the emergence of the Christian understanding of being without all of these, this concrete Christian history that preceded that. Right. right? And there's a reason that the Greeks had, I, I think you could explain, you know, almost do a Marxist reading of why did the Greeks have this phusis understanding of being, this being in its fullness? Well, think about all of the trade that was going on in that part of the world. How many people from Asia and Africa were going there to trade? The Greeks were highly exposed to different worldviews. And you could say that it's precisely the materiality of their world, the economic structure of their world, that played some part in them becoming the Greek society with, with the great fullness of being and all of that, right? And that there is this materialist uh, undergirding that played a part in that. And so, again, he, I'm, that's not Heidegger, that's me, but I, I don't see how, it's not like the Christian understanding of being truly just came out of the, the void or the, this inframing, this capitalist understanding of being came out of the void. It, 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 concrete human actions did play some part in this. So, you know, and, and think about it. It's just, it, it's interesting. Christianity was this extremely marginal sect when it first emerged. Well, usury and merchant capital, they were very marginal phenomena in that, in the world at the time. And they're on the outskirts of the symbolic order, basically played very little part. And then all of a sudden the whole world becomes a world of usury slash merchant capital in the form of industrial capital. But you see the seeds of entire worlds in little marginal activities. So I think there's something for us to do in, as I like to call it, cultivating the background to the best of our abilities. Yeah. I, you know, I've, one of the things I, I just never really found the last seven pages of this essay too meaningful. Um, though I think it's beautiful. Right. And, and, I, and, and part of that's just because I want to be able to use this. I want to be able to use this sort of inframing analysis to make sense of things. And that, that paper I wrote on um, what it was called something like social inframing or what, something like that. Um, the, the, it, I was just like so excited about this, like it was making sense of, right? So we more and more and more have the world on demand. And the more we have the world on demand, the more we want it on demand, right? And Marilyn, who, who's read this five times but couldn't join us tonight, sadly, um, said that that's where Virilio comes in because we're not just standing reserve, we're activated reserve and we're speeding up. But, um, yeah, she sent me a long message about how she wished she could have joined, and that was kind of the gist of what she was she she was wishing she would have been able to join to talk about. But hopefully, she will come for a follow up, which I'll talk about in a second. But I I wanted to to touch back on that. Yeah. So like the idea is like, I mean, just think about how frustrated uh, people are when their technology breaks down or when it's not working. Think about that Louis C K moment, right? When when uh, He's like, it's got to go to fucking space and back. Give it a second, right? But, like, people get so mad that it takes that second to go to space and back. And at the same time, you know, we all know that we're called on. Um, well, most people are called on by capital to serve it. Um, and, and, and pretty much if you want to be able to, to get some of the crumbs from it, you're going to have to work your ass off. But... Um, social media brings in like a whole new level because it's like that is then happening within the realm of communication in like the most obvious way ever. I am called on as standing reserve laying in bed by someone who needs some form of acknowledgement because they're bored or feeling angsty because they're alone. And, and I, and I say this in these terms because I mean, obviously I think I went through it and most people have probably gone through it. Um, the feeling, for, especially for years, because it took years to kind of work through and, and, and pull myself away from, but like that feeling of like, 
you just got to have like immediate responses from people. You want to, when you need to get a hold of them, you need to be able to get a hold of them. And it's like, what, what is that? Well, this helped me make sense of that. And then, I mean, what I do with that paper is I bring in Levinas and then there's like the whole thing about totalization, right? Like within in framing, something that humans have always kind of done, which is subsuming other people to categories so that we can write them off and bolster our own um, way of being or understanding of ourselves. That's only increased um, through social media. It's really easy to write people off. And then I, I showed a Facebook post today saying, Maybe that's a good thing, actually. <laughs> but at the same time, obviously, there's a negative side where it's like, it's really easy to like see someone say something and be like, oh, they're that? <sniffs> Done with them. <clears throat> Never been easier. I did that to somebody just a few days ago. I didn't tell them, but uh, I wrote them off. It's something, something I wanted to point out. So I just read... Um, what is called thinking, and which is a, a lecture series by Heidegger. And uh, there was this one part when he says that language is not a system of science. Language is language, hmm. right? And 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 that you know, obviously, everyone, every, uh, well, anyone, anyone, kind of within that postmodern milieu, semiotics. It's probably like the system of arbitrary signifiers. Um, and I know that's a great uh, simplification, but go with it for a second. The point is, is that he says that there is that sense in which it's a, ser it's, it's a bunch of arbitrary signifiers, but that certain words, though, retain this trace of their primordial significance so, 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 and that's part of his hermeneutics, his understanding of being, is that we can trace these things down to their roots, and that's what he's doing. And so, I don't know, because I just remember thinking, like, you know, there wasn't a lot of this in being in time. And I had read being in time before coming to question concerning technology, and I remember just being kind of like, this is different. This is like a different way of doing philosophy. He's he's doing a lot more with um, etymology here. Um, and, he, and, and he really thinks he can tease out like this deeper meaning that gives us this, this insight into something. And I remember, and, and I, and I somewhere seen, uh, somewhere along the way, someone had said that he has this idea that, you know, Greek has been watered down through its Latinization. Uh, and then obviously it's Germanication or Americanization or what have you. <laughs> and that, um, there were like essential ways in which, um, that, Latinization bastardized it. And, um, and and right now I'm not even interested in whether this is fully the case or if it's full of holes or what have you, but it's just important to know that kind of this is where he's coming from. He's basically like, okay, there's like this world of arbitrary signifiers we find ourselves thrown into, it's average everyday language, but we can find like words that's that 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 are rooted, you know, that, that, that you can trace out through the literature as far back as, you know, we can go. And you can trace that out and get to some sort of wellspring of, of meaning um, that's not sort of like one-sided. And, and, and I'll use an example. Uh, in the analytic philosophy department here at Boise State, there, I don't know if this is still the case, Josh, maybe you'll know, uh, in the methods course, it's like, for freshmen, basically, going into a philosophy major. There was an essay that we had to read um, where this person picks apart the idea of the good. Did you read that? You never know read I don't know. Not worth my memory bank, but 20 pages, 40 pages or so, something like that, of this person picking apart the good, right? And they're just like, well, Plato either means this, or he means this, or he means this, or he means this. And then he just system systematically goes through those things and eliminates them all until at the end of it, he's like, there's only goods. There is no good. And then he's like, he washes his hands of the whole thing and moves on with the contemporary analytic philosophy thing, right? And it's like, whereas it seems like, and going back to this four causes thing, with Heidegger, it's like, no, the phenomena 
that the, the the word you know so like the the words have taken on these different senses that's because that phenomena has different sides it's like this multi-dimensional phenomena right and so it's kind of like the phenomenological adumbration you know you're going through looking at it in these different ways I'm sure he wants to get some sort of get to some ultimate sort of primordial take on it but he's not trying to pick it apart and discard oh we'll get rid of the formal we'll get rid of the material and i just really love when he said that the silversmith is not a cause of efficiency <laughs> right which is to say like we're not a domino in some big chain of triggering events that ultimately comes to this point where it goes silver chalice is made right and then we apply signification to that no we came to the plant we made the plans for that silver chalice conceptualizing possible ways that we could bring something into being and then we went through those processes of bringing it into being by working through the gathering of all four modes uh, or four four forms uh, four, four causes we gather together those four causes we put all four of them into action in in this bringing this bringing forth uh, this poesis you know, think, one of the, Dave, think about it like this oh, I'm sorry okay think about it like this so for Heidegger the language is essentially connected to unconcealment truth right it brings things into presence and the reason that he makes qualitative distinctions at least in my opinion from how i understand them the reason he makes qualitative distinctions and this is something I, brian i'm sure will attest to right if you were to ask a neuroscientist to give you a, an account of love what's going on in the brain blah 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 right they're going to give you this scientific dry account if you ask a poet what's going on with love and the poet writes you something it's going to be much much fuller for that type of phenomenon right mm -hmm. it's not that both i mean the neuroscientist is revealing a truth to you right it, it, it he can very well operate that way in the brain but for the phenomenon of love a <laughs> poet's going to unconceal it in a much fuller way with his words and so there is a sense in which given different types of phenomena different types of words are going to unconceal them more fully closer to the, their essence right and heidegger is an essentialist in a sense he he you know sartre read him incorrectly in being in time and you, you get the whole existence precedes essence thing in sartre and he thinks it's heideggerian and it's not the reason heidegger puts essence in quotes there is another reason time and time again in this essay you see him talking about the essence of man and so Heidegger does think Dasein has an essence that we have an essence. Well, uh, what you find is that he thinks certain types of language, even different languages, he thought German was better for philosophy than English and French and all of that, uh, which of I think course. It's right about French, by the way, but yeah, keep going. <laughs> right, but no, it's just this idea that you know, if you go to the phenomenology, and I, I'm, he doesn't engage in explicit phenomenology in his later work so much you don't hear him talk about phenomenal but he's still a phenomenologist and much of these insights if you think of them like ah what's the phenomenology here it's exactly an example like that where yeah the neuroscientist can reveal something true to you and how they present the brain activity of love but you get a good poet write to you what love is about or what's going on in love it is a qualitatively different experience and so he thinks that you know but again for if you take mathematical physics you could say no it's it's the way that physicists present it that is better than maybe a poet could present that right perhaps they they that language is better suited for that that it can more fully grasp it uh and so he he's trying to point out how language itself and different signifiers think about that think about these moments where we use one word to try to say something we're, we're attempting to say and we go nah, that word didn't quite get it well if all words are arbitrary we think we can just get words to say anything arbitrarily we wouldn't search sometimes you'd say oh well you know the shining of nature well shining didn't get it the gleaming of nature right gleaming's better somehow and he's very very attentive to that type of stuff because of his deep appreciation, uh, uh, appreciation of Holderland and 
Rilke and those other guys. Well, you know, one of the words that struck me, the difference between, say, the word depression, which seems sort of depressing, but sort of abstract in a way, and mourning. Ooh. I mean, the word, when I, when I lit on that word mourning, I felt like I've been in mourning my whole fucking life. <laughs> That's what my life is all about. And, uh, you know, a binary opposites did not create mourning. But there's something far less passive about mourning. Mourning is like something you do, whereas like depression is something you have. Yeah. Mm. It, uh, but it's like, but yeah, the, the idea that there are certain words that have a life to them. To me, like mourning is one of those words. And uh, the fact that it's similar to a different word, mourning, doesn't make a lot of difference to me because it's the what shines through. So, yeah, I can see what you're saying here. Thank you for uh, that insight. Think about just, I mean, if, if you, I don't think a lot of the times we, we realize how much prefixes and suffixes resonate with us, right? right. But just the D in depression, right? Think about D, d deduct, right? This takeaway. Well, what if mourning, in a sense, even though in a weird sense you've lost something, mourning seems to capture this fullness that something you, something's assailed you that, you, that you're in the presence of something that you weren't before. And so it's not merely just a subtraction. And so this is where you get into this kind of the, the subtleties of these uh, syllables, right? And that somehow certain syllables can be why we go, oh, that didn't get it or or that, that, that didn't fully express what I'm trying to say. And um, yeah, I think it goes back I, in some weird way. We are attuned to the etymology of words in a kind of pre-theoretical, pre-linguistic way, right? We, we have a sense that didn't get it right. That, that didn't really capture it. And that goes to say that it's not just a matter of words, just these words are synonyms. So they're all equivalent. No, that's missing something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I wanted to point out too, just because we said this off camera before we started, uh, we've no, I've noted that this is a lecture, right? And that I didn't know that the first two or three times I read it. Like I only found out later that Heidegger hated writing and, and pretty much you would just get him in lecture form most of the time after having been forced to write being in time to keep his job basically. And which by the way, just... I've been reading the history of academia and part of it is like the German, the development of the German uni research university and how the interventions of the ministry, which is the state, um, sh shaped the discourses that took place in the university. It was the, it was basically the state was saying, okay, we'll throw all this money at these professors because they're doing some kind of a public service. People like going to their lectures, they give public lectures, let's throw money at them. And then all of a sudden they, they, they start being like, okay, some of these professors aren't even like showing up and giving their lectures. Some of these students aren't even like learning anything. Okay. So then they started wanting checks and balances. They wanted to start regulating and securing results, which is, I mean, really this in framing of education is one of the big critiques that uh, critical pedagogists take. And um, I mean, obviously like what, what the fuck are we to do? It's just like this double bind that we're in, but um it's just funny because without that happening, Heidegger wouldn't have been forced to write being in time before he was ready to. He wouldn't have been threshed out into the, the limelight when he was. And then there's all these different things. I mean, everything about him, basically, that we know is influenced by that, um, by him. I mean, even the stuff he wrote before being in time is he knew he had to write this fucking book a few years before he had to write it. And so his lectures even before then are all in preparation for this thing that he had to do that he didn't really want to do. Okay. But then getting back to the point though, this is a lecture and, and to read it as him, him talking, he was known for basically putting his students in this like weird state, like trance, right? He had like this power, this charisma and, and this way with words that what, when he talks about being in framing sway, I think about, Hannah Arendt and Herbert Marcuse and Emmanuel Levinas and 
Jean-Paul Sartre and Jacques Derrida and Lacan all sitting there and Gadamer all, all just like in the sway of Heidegger, right? Swept along and they're just like, and, and they're all so influenced by it. And to read it that way, to think about the fact that he's connecting with his students on this level and that they would, they would spend a lot of office hours with him too, if you read up on this, um, he knows them. And, and I don't, I'm not going to say he cares about them. I'm assuming he does, though, because he talks about this um, in, in, in like what is called thinking. He talks about this, this connection that the, the, the teacher has with the students. So um, he has his audience in mind throughout this. And, 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 and this teasing out of language and this constantly, and, and there's a bit of repetition, you know, but he describes the process of thought in what is called thinking as standing in the draft, like standing on the, in, in, in like the, the standing in the tide of the ocean, right? The waves, they just come, he come in and smash it on the, on the beach. And, you know, he thinks that every great thinker is sort of marked by that fact that they always were asking one question over and over and over and over again, all these different ways, which obviously for him was being, but, um, you, I don't know. The, every time I come back to this, I, I, I feel that more. There's this, there's this, you know, he's, he's leading you in and he's like, all right, don't get caught up on any specific thing I say. And then, you, you know, so like the analytic part of me goes, okay, that's a, that's a good way to cheat. Right. I'm not going to hold you to anything you say. So how, but the thing is, is he's going to say it several times in different ways and he does. So, uh, um, yeah, and th th that's something that I was tracking this time, and I just was like, especially after reading what is called thinking, I was like, that makes a lot more sense. So, this is a question for everybody. Um, I came tonight because I've read uh, Russian Train Technology yet, yet, because you know it's the end of the course. Um, but I want a little bit of preview on it. Something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is. Um, right, because you're in a Heidegger class right now with Dr. Gardner. Yeah, that's, sorry for people that are listening. Yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in a Heidegger class right now with Dr. Gardner. It's my first reading of Heidegger. Um, so we've hit on a couple of really cool things. It seems to me that a person has to have a certain cognitive ability in order to... Um, in order to even have these experiences that we're talking about. So we talk about the neuroscientist telling somebody that's supposedly a truth, at least, at least it's an authentic truth, right? About some kind of chemical that you know, tickles a certain part of your brain a certain way where you can feel love. And they tell someone that, and then uh, the Hyderians go, yeah, okay, yeah, fine. Um, but you actually know love through feeling love, and how that's accessed is through, the, is through um, some kind of moving work. So it seemed, you know, work, work of poetry or something, or actually experiencing love in a certain way or something. Um, my, my question is, is so it, it seems like this experience is based upon having some past experience. So if you, if you are this sort of like cave person and you're raised in the hills by yourself and then you come down and, uh, and someone tells you some really moving poem that's moving to everybody else, but it just doesn't, doesn't hit, the, the person's not attuned to this truth in any type of way, shape, or form until he's told that, um, you know, this, this chemical tickles his brain a certain way, take this pill, he feels it, and now he knows the truth that the poet tells him, right? So it's like, at what point, I mean, how do these things sort of feed off each other? Right, it's like, it, I mean... So is it possible to go to a lecture of some kind and some person is, who's a, just as a god can speak to you in such a way? He uses the, the exact right words for every person in, in the audience and, and, and he tells everybody what, what it is to, you know, uh, phenomenon A, right? It's like, I don't know if I buy that necessarily. It seems like all this is predicated on past experience. And I think there's a reason why everybody here is a little bit older than the typical undergraduate student. Everyone here's lived life of some kind, and these things these things speak truth truth, truth to them in a certain way. Um, I'm wondering if, if this experience is really like the primordial sort of like truth, um, because it seems like yeah we we might be attuned to these things. The attunement is built through experience itself, right? Means 
this baby that's raised in this white box or confident or something comes out isn't attuned to anything. Except maybe being <laughs> raised in a white box, right? So I don't know if I buy I don't know if I if I buy this like the source of truth being um, some kind of poetic choice of word usage. And that may be because I haven't read questions concerning technology or I haven't even finished being in time. I mean, I just passed, I mean, I just got into temporality. So, if any, yeah, if anybody can explain that to me. But how it could be the case that experiences doesn't come first. And I can see how it would be the case that we'd be attuned, so to speak, first, right? But it's it, this hit, this, this like, this, this putting on that comment, like, yes, seems a little weird to me, which I'm sure is understandable. <laughs> Well, what, how I'd respond to that is, yeah, he would absolutely say on some level you have to be integrated into the world first, right? You, I mean, we could use the example of, you know, you can't explain love in any way, shape, or form to an ant, right? So if we use this, the example of the caveman, the, the caveman is, in a sense, operating as somebody who's never been integrated into the world. And so, right, there, there there's a bridge that would have to be, there's a gap that would have to be bridged first. And Heidegger would fully admit that, that before you can have any type of experience of language the way I was describing, it presupposes Dasein already being in the world in some way, shape, or form. So it's not in, you know, explaining it to a caveman or somebody who's completely outside of our worldhood or our symbolic order, that's not going to happen. But right. a poet could easily unconceal something about love to somebody who's never been in love but has grown up in the culture and has familiarity with people talking about love seeing it in movies seeing it you know in the the friendships uh their friends being in love with people and it's precisely because we have being with that the other is part of our essential structure as an individual dasein that we're able to have these types of truths revealed to us now is it as fully perceived as maybe it would be if you yourself were in love no but there's all kinds of things that we can learn or see or perceive on the basis of language that we ourselves you know if somebody starts telling you about china even though you've never been to china before it's going to present china to you in a certain way and this is what heidegger is getting at with language is that it's essentially connected to truth right, right. that it has this uh dimension of uh the event of truth. So, in so the okay. and I will just say really quick that you missed the part where Michael unpacked um, yeah, yeah, philosophy, yeah. the Heidegger's philosophy of truth, and mm -hmm. how it works. And you might have heard it from Gardner, but it would be different because I just think that Michael spent a lot more time with Heidegger exactly. and 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 has a way with 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 explaining it without really losing a lot. And yeah, so yeah, Michael, I I think. It would be really, really helpful to me if you can answer. So I mean, this is the main thing that's been bothering me about Heidegger ever since getting into him is, 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 is you mentioned that yeah, you couldn't explain love to an ant, right? But at what point cognitively do, does Dasein cease to become Dasein, right? So and what I mean by that is you can have a fully capable caveman and there needs to be this bridge bridged in some way. But I mean, it leaves room for uh, excluding a lot of people from 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 being people, or as important as Dasein in a certain way, right? I mean, the person who's born with half a brain is not cognitive, cognitively able to be with in any way, right? And so it's like there's this scary sort of sense that Heidegger, I don't know if he was, uh, I mean, probably was super elitist, right? I don't know, but it's like it's like. It leaves a lot of room for um, this really terrible sense, I think, of elitism. Like Reality also leaves a lot of terrible space for terrible things that we have to correct for. Right? So, I, I, like, that's what social contracts theory and the, the struggle for justice is about. But, right? but it seems weird to think that someone born with half a brain is not a per is not Dasein. Right. It's not to me, though. I mean, because, I mean, Dasein, as he lays out, has essential structures. 
just because something doesn't meet those criteria doesn't mean that we're in any way, shape or form uh, permitted to do harm to them or that because animals are for Heidegger uh, poor in world that it's okay to harm them. Uh, I don't think that any type of morality follows from this. What he's trying to do is he's trying to pinpoint what it is to be human or Dasein at its fullest. And just because somebody, because of a, a, a brain disformity or whatever, uh, maybe not able to do that, I don't think there's anything in there that would say, oh, well, you can just totally dehumanize them or treat them. I mean, you got to realize part of what Heidegger's fundamental point in the end framing thing is he's upset that we treat rocks and trees in a way that is so uh, without sympathy or recognition of their worth, right? He, he, he thinks we don't we don't live into the full presencing or worth of you know inanimate objects trees and uh uh rocks and so forth so I, I think you would definitely say you know no i mean there's there's a there's a certain dignity to being a being as such and the problem is is not recognizing that right so no the answer is no <laughs> he doesn't the answer is no right he so doesn't do ethics so Right. I mean, it just seems, it just seems a little weird to, it seems weird. It seems like you would, you would imply. So in, in saying, if, if, if someone were to, were, to, were to sit down in this room and say, I'm not, I'm not implying, I'm not stating an ethic. I'm not putting forth an ethic. Um, but here's a really, really nice, sophisticated, beautiful argument for why people would have their brain should be treated as things as such and not Dasein. Uh, these things look like Dasein. They're not Dasein. Doesn't mean we should treat them as much dignity as we should or ought to. And by the way, I'm not doing ethic, but we should treat F rocks and trees. You know, I'm disappointed with the way that we're treating them as being present as such. Well, these people are present as such too, but they're not Dasein. It's like uh, it just seems, yeah, it's just. It's See, but I don't, I don't have any issue with that in the sense. It's like, it's like saying somebody isn't a basketball player because they don't meet certain criteria. I mean. It's just, uh, you know, we use concepts in a sense to be able to distinguish things, to recognize differences. And I think simply recognizing a difference that, okay, this, this entity may very well be a homo sapien, but if they're brain dead, right, they're not Dasein because they don't, because Dasein is what it, what it does. And if you go through the criteria, Dasein takes a stand on its being, it projects itself into the future. It uses a certain referential totality to take a stand on its being to i.e. have a social identity. These are all criteria that the vast majority of human beings are doing on a daily basis. So just because one of, some of us have uh, gen genetic problems or medical issues that would infringe on that doesn't shape or change the, the parameters of Dasein itself. Yeah, and I can also love Rascal and I can see someone wanting to discard him or put him to use in some way that I would take as morally abhorrent. And I mean, we don't have to do meta like, like moral philosophy, you know, to, to say it like a normative sense that he's family or that, I mean, he can even get as basic as property. He's my property, which I think is stupid. He's my companion, but you know, the, but the other thing that we, we can't be asking height. I, well, I, well, we can we can, and everyone always does, want to interrogate why Heidegger doesn't do this or doesn't do that, and and, if, and then we can like read these and these things into it. And and there, I've read a lot of stuff. You know, there's a lot of I've I've, I've read biographies on Heidegger. I've read a lot of essays on Heidegger. I've read I've read people that fucking hate Heidegger. I've read people that defend him. And um, at the end of the day, though, we I mean, this is just not his project. Right, and we can't ask him to do everything. It's like, hey, who are you to ask questions about what it is to be a person thrown into a world? What about rabbits? It's just like, he would just be like, dude, get the fuck out of here. This is not what I'm doing. Right, and that's the thing is that like analytic philosophy demands that you do everything before you say anything. You right. can't say anything about the about being until you've sat there and gone through but this is every little step, right? So, so, so he kind of says, yeah, well, I'm going to get straight to the fact that I'm thrown into this world and that I'm always already thrown into this world. 
And, 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 and by the way, he's what he's in, in the reading where you're reading right now. I mean, he's mainly going after Descartes, the Cartesian mode of being is the one we're still probably primarily arguably in. And that's the one that sees animals as robots, not Heideggerian philosophy, right? But, but you're right in this respect that every metaphysical framework, every set of ontological recognitions or commitments or whatever you want to call it, has uh, ethical implications. Just like any ethical framework has some presumed set of uh, you know meta met metaphysics behind it. But while that may be true, that doesn't mean... It, like in this case, that he bothered to unpack that. Sure. But of course, I, I would say it is it is it is unavoidable and an uncomfortable fact that there are ethical implications to this kind of this way of thinking. Yeah, and the most the, the most concerning to me is is just the room for interpretation that he leaves. So it's like yeah, I'm not going to do the entire project, but it's like, damn it, man, you did so much. Like, just say that we, you know, right? Um. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, it could be the case he was like, yeah, I could write, I could write volumes on this, and I just need to take a break and think about other things. Um, but given the amount of room left for interpretation, um, it just, it's just really, it's really concerning or disconcerting to me, I should say. It's just not. Well, this doesn't really answer your question, but obviously, you know, he Heidegger's central question seemed to revolve around being and un understanding. This understanding of human beings as the being that inquires into the nature of being, right? Um, but uh, a, a whole other question, you know, is okay. And this seems to, and this kind of introduces the, you know, the ethical implication is what what gives being or any categories of being their value? Um, and some some might argue. Depending on you know what what your framework is, you know, some some might say that you know that, that's the wrong question, you know, or we can't, it, it, you know, it, uh, answer that meaningfully or or what whatever. But that, that that that's that's kind of what occurs to me is like okay, what what gives what gives being its value, and I'm not sure what I would say. You know, obviously I think you would say the. Uh, we, you know, he is talking about thrownness. We were thrown into the situation, you know, that we're in. You know, what we kind of value what we recognize, right? You know, we're we're we're, we're we didn't we didn't pick we didn't choose to be Dasein. We got we didn't ask to be here in the first place. No, we got tossed. We, we got tossed, and you sort of discover it, discover it from within, right? Yeah. Kind of figure it out, you know, you know, as you go, it. it it, it unfolds. It, it's 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 revealed, right? You know, our our, our our process of being designed and living a human life reveals being at least our being to 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 us. You know, but it's not necessarily something then that you can spell out in some reductionistic way as a result, yeah. because we because we don't discover it. We don't discover it all in the abstract and then go, oh, now that I understand it abstractly. You know, he, you know, here it is. It's like no, it's, we understand it through well, it's a phenomenology right? through through experience. I want to throw in also though that the reason I followed being time up with totality and infinity is precisely because I was told by people such as Michael Downs, but I kept seeing the name Levinas you know, coming up over and over and over again for a while there. Yeah, that Emmanuel Levinas most successfully in the realm of phenomenology um, goes into the ethical territory. Uh, in fact, his whole project, I think, a simplified way of explaining it, is to flip um, Heideggerian ontology on its head, ground it in ethics. I was going to say, I was on say, the face it's of so nice an interpretation of this based on like this sort of through an ethical lens. Right, and, it, and it's through the face-to-face -face experience. The face is more, not just faces, it's it's expressivity of precarity. It's the fact that I know, like, in my heart of hearts, and always in the very back of my mind, you could kill me right now, and that I could kill you right now. And that fragility, that precarity, that 
it puts us in this in this place of fear and trembling and, and vulnerability with the other where if where we want to we want to shore up and secure and 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 that's why we build our spheres we reinforce our spheres with um ideologies that can categorize and write off other people right demonize and let them just oh well that's them and we oh but we're right and then you know and it's just like this tendency that's like very like much like a it's a basic sort of thing that humans do but the thing is is that levy knows you know he gets asked oh but what about animals and it wasn't interesting to him and he was a jew persecuted by nazi by germans if you came out of World War One or World War Two, you you don't give a fuck about rabbits. <laughs> right. Well, you care about people getting put in gas chambers. Right. right? So you might want yeah. to address this this sliding scale of cognitive capacity. Right. It's like because you know. Well, and that's where I was just about to go. So I just want to say that really quick, just to. That's really good. Thank you for that. Exactly. This book. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this. I I I presented this paper in uh, at Duke University a couple years ago on. Basically, from this book, it's called Eco Phenomenology Back to the Earth Itself. And it's these people influenced primarily, there's different people writing, you know, it's an anthology of essays, but overall, it's environmental ethics through phenomenology using the main sources being Husserl, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Levinas. There's some other ones, but that's, that's most of the influences. Well, Ian Thompson at the University of New Mexico, who's one of my favorite philosophy commentators, and he's mine and Michael's friend on Facebook, is he wrote this 30-page essay that's basically a review of that book, where he says, look, there's basically two arguments here. One is natural, like ethics is like this natural thing, and the other one is that ethics is this transcendent thing. And and he and it and he basically says the natural version is Husserlian Nietzschean, and the transcendent version is Levinasian Heideggerian, and that's because Levinas and Heidegger are very open to and basically okay with there being some mystery in the world and something beyond knowledge, and therefore maybe we should be careful before we run around and decide things for sure. So it's it's and in that worldview, there's like a violence in being confident about things. Just, just to clear things right? up, so they would believe there's some sort of ethical value in the world, right? Yeah. We're assuming some, yeah, we're there's assuming something. There's something ethical. But it's, sort of it's something, right? It's, you wave your hands about it, right? Yeah, and then, so then like the Nietzsche and, uh, who else? Nietzsche. Husserl. And, and yeah, Husserl would be like, uh, we can explain this in terms of... Evolutionary biology, basically. Right. Right, like apple, we get the idea of badness because after the apple is rotten, if you eat it, you feel bad, right? And then we, we kind of just like, that We're idea... Just, like, starts, is the result of... Yeah. But so that's yeah. all too... Right. That's far too reductionistic approach or something like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you could, you could, you could get that. But at the same time, you know, Heidegger loves who's for Nietzsche. So, um, but he, he's a bit more of a Taoist, a little bit more of an, an agnostic, a little bit more like, who knows, man? Right. Um, and, you know, Wittgenstein would say, maybe we shouldn't talk about the stuff we can't. And Heidegger says, well, I'll, I'll dance around it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I'll try, but I'm going to dance. The thing I wanted to say, and this is like my big moment, everybody, check oh, it out. I got this Facebook message from Ian Thompson right before this started, and he agreed to do a follow-up with us. Hey, so, great. um probably two Mondays from now awesome. um, and we can interrogate him on that in that 30 page essay he he, he it confronts that question of levels of that is really of Dasein awesome. There's like, he's, he, he basically goes through a bunch of arguments why it's not necessary and then he says but I still can't stop thinking about it so here's a basic sketch and then he gives seven <laughs> levels of how that would work this is like do what you will yeah yeah I was just going to say, uh, Wittgenstein and Heidegger don't necessarily see language the same way, though. Um, I, I am, am not an expert in either one of them, but it, it always felt to me like Heidegger thought that he could get some kind of, I don't know, ontological insight, or there was, there was some kind of, you know, deep, hidden something or other within within the, the, the words within the words themselves. And that was part of the reason he was so fascinated with, you know, Greek 
roots and you know, you know Greek etymology and so on, you know. And whereas Wittgenstein, it always seemed to me more like he was saying, well, language is it's irreducibly complex, and that's why he you know talks about it being like a game that you know the, a game that we play, you know. But you you can't. It, it, it can't, it, it is kind of irreducible, but the, one of the things you can't do is an, uh, extract ontology out of it. Um, because that's not what, that's not what it does. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's why we get all kinds of, you know, problems, you know, uh, contradictions, whatever you want to call them. Um, when, when, when we, when we try and use, the way that language works, you know, or, or we try and try and use language as a way of, you know, uh, you know, extracting, you, you know, ontology or, or, or making, you know, some kind of, you know, ontological, you know, yeah, pronouncement. Your, right, right. And he's, he's, he's like that. That's not what. That's not what language is doing. Don't do that with it. You know. Yeah. Don't don't speak of it. You, you know. Don't. I don't talk very much a thing. Yeah. One of one of the other important, and this is just a lingering thing you brought up from earlier. And, it, and this is kind of what I was pointing to when I said you missed that part with Michael, is just that you you get this idea because Heidegger's going for what's primordial, that he thinks that he got it, and that therefore that's the end of the story, which is not true to phenomenology as the as a method, um, and not true to his uh, conception of truth, right? Because with every revealing there's a concealing yeah or veiling is uh, unveiling is revealing you know as i said or like this curtain if you move it over here this becomes blocked right over here this becomes blocked right which is obviously like lights. one of the things that science is really good at is like dialing shit in um by doing these let's, let's move movements. all over the place you know? yeah yeah but 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 as as far as like and this is the one of the things michael was talking about was that there's like this at that being level, that experience of being, that a collective, a, a culture, or, a, or the caveman, or what have you, my experience, um, that itself is a revealing. It's a truth event, and that. Um, so there's this there's a, there is this piece though where you're you're onto something, but he preempts it in the essay. So when you read it, you'll see it there, yeah. where. His conception of truth makes makes it totally okay that the caveman comes down, and even if he has released some oxytocin on occasion, maybe he loved a squirrel. You know, who gives a fuck? Maybe he had like a, a relationship with some some de some deity. A volleyball. The moon. Yeah, you know, he just like fell in love with the moon. Whatever it is, any human going into any other. Uh, community that has its own symbolic orders and its own background practices is going to be weird it's like and you the the closer you are to that culture the easier it's going to be to kind of like oh i get it so if i go to the south i'm like you know this is kind of weird but then i can get the hang of it pretty quick right if i go to japan it's gonna take a little bit longer right and there i think that's okay that that love can be experienced in different ways and and but the to say that there's a poetic experience of oxytocin or that the poetic experience of love releases oxytocin, neither of those erases the other. Right. It's not just an either or. I mean, you, you can argue that, you, you know, that, that, that language shapes culture, but, you know, culture also shapes language. But yet, and you don't have, you know, the emergence of language unless you have culture and this network of relationships and so on but they they feed back and forth you know on each other it's not just one it's not just one made the other right yeah. well you know there's this dialectic between experience and neuroscience i'm thinking of about how heidegger could, could cast this spell over people seemingly um you know when you're growing up um uh, empathy I know what you're feeling. I mean, this is really a natural thing. So it's an experience like you, and you pick up these social cues, like uh, the way an eyebrow is lifted up or a, a, a look in the eye, and you, I know what you're feeling. 
and you really do. And, she and there's a you. neuroscientific she, aspect. She touches your arm. Uh, she touches your arm. Yeah. There, in Utopia now. There, there's a there's a neuroscientific aspect to this, and there's, so there's kind of an empathetic transference. And this is something that is a capacity. part of the background, and we experience it fully, but it is really chemical, too. There's all sorts of research into this, and I think that Heidegger had this gift for probably this, not only this empathetic transference, but... He probably had a way of, of speaking and uh, his body language and everything that uh, kind of like it was hot, hot cognition. Oh, that sounds great. Mm. And it uh, like there are like terms that when they're used in just the right sequence, it's like a bing. And, and so I think that like there's an experiential thing going on there based on just ordinary human empathy. And, and there's a real chemical basis, too, uh, because the reason all sorts of people talk about right. no. Heidegger is because even though he was a fucking Nazi, <laughs> he had yeah. something. And, uh, and he, it besides was, the swastika. It was yeah. infectious, uh, or but in a good way. But, uh, but anyway, just the stuff I've read about neuroscience and that, that extent of, like, and transference and all of this. I don't know. I, I, I can see how the two work together. They're not necessarily opposed. No, there's so that's something that I've been how I understand circumspection is is um, what they call your you know what the neuroscientists call your and neuroscience what the neuroscientist calls the default mode network. Mm -hmm. um, and when things become lit up, when things break in life. Right, you're, you're, you're knocked out of this default, default mode network. There's all, there's all kinds of stories as to why you have a default mode network in the first place. It's a, it's a lot cheaper to have a default mode network, for example. But any good enter good entertainer, um, if you guys are into stand-up like I am, you've been to shows I was where, just thinking, that's yeah. exactly what I was thinking about the stand-up. Yeah, well, and that's, that's how I understand circumspection and breaking becoming lit up. It's because when you're watching somebody, and he's controlling the room in such a way, where everyone's completely circumscribed, I mean, to what's going on around them, but also uh, servicitude. Servicitude, like technical word for being with people. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're just completely engrossed in, in, in what's going on. I mean, that, that's that's what I imagine how you're getting as, as he gives a lecture. He understands this so well that he's able to create this environment for people. Um, but at the same time, he's able to explain how things become lit up, probably because he gives people the experience of, uh, the, the experience of things becoming lit up. You know, uh, everyone's everyone's uh, in a trance, and he breaks the trance and introduces the, the concept of becoming lit up. It, what what a better way, um, besides of, of already having the capacity to sort of make that connection on your own to stand up, right? right. To well, learn what lit up is. You know, well, there, there's some there's something really powerful about kind of being able to take people on a ride. Yeah. You know. You know. In in that respect. And, and maybe they wouldn't necessarily be able to do so on their own, but you know, someone who's gifted, whether they're funny or they're a storyteller or a great lecturer or whatever, they're they're able to do that. They're able to kind of, you know, lift people up and you know and take take them, transport them, take them for you, know, take them for that ride, yeah. take them on that journey. And there's something there that there's. And not everyone has access to it, right? Um, it's a people, especially, human where it's kind of like, yeah, exactly. Well, right. exceptions kind of drive home the rule, right? Um, because we all have to take care of exceptions when it comes to something like social cues, right? Or, or at least help. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, or take care of me, you know, with, with my shirt. But um, I wanted to point to tie this back to morning and just to say that if you give someone ecstasy and say, ah, now they've experienced love. You're wrong. Because sure. the, the, the serotonin and uh, deprivation um, that ensues after ecstasy is not the loss of love. Uh, and that love always contains its, its what if, just as like Dasein always has its... So the argument is to be made that 
Yeah, okay, so we can talk about like our very limited and blind understanding of like, uh, um, you know, the chemicals or the that juice that's that's released in your brain. So we can say oxytocin, we know it's associated with feelings of like, euphoria or something. The argument is to be made that we can exactly replicate the structure of your, your experience, with, uh, experience, uh, as, and it's like, so yeah, I can, I, I can, as the evil neuroscientist, so to speak, make you do that, but. Um, from the from the hygiene point of view, it's like fine. You've recreated that mode of, you've created that, uh, you've simulated, you've simulated, it, right? You've simulated this experience. But uh, this is my experience with you know, uh, Sandra, right? You can't simulate my experience with her. You can just recreate a general feeling of some kind that I do feel. And so yeah, I mean, it's just like it, it's the totality of these experiences that make makes. Uh, you know, when we use the word love, we come to a common understanding, I think, because of the totality of our past experience. It's like, oh, that makes sense. And I, it, it, it's, it's, it's irksome how, when you read Heidegger and, and you're really into neuroscience, how you can make connections between the two. And then when you do, you go, fuck, I'm not supposed to do this because it's somehow important and different. Um, well, and I, well, and also just with continental philosophy, the goal is always to get outside of this normative matrix. Um, that we're in, and um, so that you can get a new take on things. And I do think that when we're trying to unpack a difficult text, hold on, that when we're trying to unpack a difficult text, to even understand it first, um, we don't statement by statement hold it up against the totality of everything we take for granted or that a 12 year old in a science class already knows, right? Like sure, sure. the idea is that we want to kind of go out on limbs and be okay with living through some questions and wrap our heads around some new and difficult concepts so that we can have this fresh take or fresher take that might reveal something. And so I think we're, we're where we were getting to was that this, that there's, that it does seem like he succeeds in um, revealing something. I don't know. And I think that you, you also missed part of what is here, right? We, you kind of came in on us talking about more of how he goes about doing what he goes about doing and stuff like that. So I look forward. So when, so, well, I'll leave that um, because honestly, we're at time. Um, but I'd like to push past time just a, a little bit, like five, 10 minutes, and we can pick up on this conversation, but I want to table it so that we can finish out on this for now. Um, hopefully some folks will have a chance of revisiting it before we bring Ian Thompson on, or at least the Lee Raver version of this. Um, hopefully you'll get a chance to read it yeah. before oh, yeah. Ian Thompson's here. I'll also send you that 30 page essay if you're interested in that. Yes. But yeah, so kind of having, yeah, so let's open up a, sp a space real quick to just say, do we have any hanging tabs, lingering questions, comments, anything that anything anyone felt like should be touched on or unpacked a little bit, perhaps before going back for a second reading? Just on a kind of random note, I want to say if anybody is interested, since we were talking about Wittgenstein and Heidegger, Lee Braver, one of his other great books, is a comparative study of Wittgenstein and Heidegger, and it's first rate. I highly recommend it. And he thinks... Oh, what's he, the name of it? Lee Braver? Uh, yes. Uh, it's called Groundless Grounds, a study of Wittgenstein and Heidegger. Yeah. And... Uh, Actually, it's good. The paperback's out now. I had the I had to buy the expensive hard copy when it originally came out, but there's a paperback now, and he argues that there's a uh, there's a lot of parallels between later Wittgenstein and Heidegger. This is something that Hubert Dreyfus also recognized, and so it's a really great study. And as, especially if you're trying to find a way to bridge analytic philosophy and continental philosophy, this is a great book to do that with. Oh, analytic philosophers are already over Wittgenstein, apparently. <laughs> not even fucking teach him. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I was just saying this is not an interesting in those professors. No. But, um, 
Yeah, and Dawson just read that. Dawson was going to join, but he wasn't able to do last second. Um, that was grounds. It's a shame that they don't they don't include more of a, of a holistic picture of philosophies and discipline. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. It really is. <laughs> Anybody else? For cl closing thoughts, anyone? I really want to read this whole thing. Oh, Gremlins, Gremlins. Yeah, yeah what's, that, what's that paper called that you're talking about? The fish paper. paper. I'll pull it up. Um, Ian Thompson has his own website that has some of his publications listed on the front page, and it's one of them. It also has like a three-minute video clip, or maybe it's shorter, of him talking about text. Um, and it's actually a clip from the movie Being in the World, which is where I first found out about him, mm -hmm. which we should watch sometime. Is there a movie? Movie? Yes, we should. Definitely. Yeah, there's a movie for that. And it gets really into like Japanese stuff because there's, there's this Japanese uh, carpenter kind of highlighted throughout the film because, you know, the, the craftsman experience is so important to hire here. So. But yeah, Ian Thompson's like standing there on a windswept beach talking about how like the deep texts are these ones you can keep returning to. Um, and there's always something like just like new and life changing. Oh, so is he the man, is he the guy the sort of bigger guy with the beard? Yeah, he looks yeah, like dead a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah, no, he's gonna be joining us in like two weeks. So. That's insane. Yeah. That's yeah, that's cool, man. No, I reached out to him in my undergrad, so um well I guess if anybody doesn't have anything else, we'll close out. Thanks for joining Tegan, Jacob, and Michael. Thanks. Good discussion. Glad to see people reading Heidegger. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for your explanation, man. Yes. And anyone Thank who you. wants to see what literary language can do, join us for 100 Years of Solitude by Marquez starting in two weeks. Thursday night, this time, in two weeks. Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude. Have a good one. Bye now. Good work. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'm fine. I've got a copy of.